how on earth did does an individual with disabilities access that content and and uh, how does a blind individual in particular you know use a computer and navigate the web and everything else that's when this whole thing started what's up this is ty with the hearsay podcast today we're going to be hearing from sean bradley not only a great friend of mine but also the co-founder of audio Eye. you'll hear about his journey into the startup world and some of the challenges he faced and how he overcame them sean welcome to the podcast so excited to have you so as some of you know, uh, again, Sean's a co-founder of Audio Eye. I've had the pleasure of working for with him for the last 12 years on our journey here. But today, we, uh, you know, Sean, we just want to learn a little bit about about the journey of Audio Eye. We've heard a lot of crazy stories and a lot of pivoting um, to really get to where we are today. So and talk a little bit about yourself. Where'd you go to school? And, and when, where do you reside today? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we reside in Tucson, Arizona. It's our headquarters. It continues to be our headquarters, has been since uh, inception. This journey really started to me when I was actually in in college. I was just a freshman at the University of Arizona here in town. And, Bear down. Uh, Bear yeah, down. At the time, my brother and I had had a full-time job and and also going to school. Um, we, we stepped away from our day jobs and went all in on uh, our first adventure together, just in terms of uh, wanting to be entrepreneurs and, and start something fresh and something of our own. Our first... Uh, Venture was surround. It was centered around um, online video and helping businesses bring streaming media content, bringing their videos online. It, it was really at the beginning of that. Um, we were just kind of seeing that on websites and you know the proliferation of video content. Creating the first tech company. So were you were you in college on that first one? Were you like you know grinding away, going to class, and then also and also starting the company? Yeah, just just putting time right, just getting the getting the hours in at school, and then um, you know we really honestly started um, out, of the, out of the house I grew up in. We were in the back room with some new computers that we bought and um, had had high bandwidth and I think DSL connection or whatever that that was needed to kind of get get going. And uh, yeah, it was an exciting time for sure. It was it was uh, Something that we, you know, didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do with my life, but I, I knew I wanted to work with my brother, and that's what we sought out to do. That's awesome. So then, so you're in college, you, you know, start start this company with your brother. You guys are starting to go go at it, and you know, start starts to go pretty well. But then, all of a sudden, the the idea of audio Can you can you walk through our users? Like, how did it come about? Um, was there was there a moment in time that you're like, whoa, this is this is going to hit? Because this is early on, what, like 2007, 2005 that you're, that you're doing this? I'm not dating you, Sean. Yeah, uh, no, just, just throwing no, it out there. Even earlier, yeah. Actually, it was, uh, you know, 2002, 2003, actually, when um, really early on in, in, in those first uh, few years of working together and, and building out this company, uh, my brother had come back to, to the office, a small group of us, and just shared with us the, you know, the fact that he had just gotten back from an eye appointment and they had diagnosed him with a degenerative disease in his right eye. And um, ultimately, him sharing that is is the genesis for for Audio Eye today. It's, um, you know, it got us thinking about, you know, the things that we were building at the time, everything from the video content to these rich interactive experiences um, that we were building for for clients. Um, Using and, a lot of flash, right? Yeah, using flash. <laughs> yeah, Macromedia was the the tool of the time, right? So I think um, it really got us thinking about, you know, how how on earth did does an individual with disabilities access that content, and and uh, how does a blind individual in particular, you know, use a computer and navigate the web and everything else? And um, that's when this whole thing started. It was really just discovery around that experience for blind individuals in particular. And um, one of the first things we did, we had an aunt that worked um, at a, an organization called Sun Sounds of Arizona. So they specialize in reading content to uh, blind individuals. Um, and uh, we got with her and she brought us to the table, brought my brother to the table with individuals with disabilities that were using um, accessible technologies uh, to, to navigate, to, to use the computer and, and everything else. And so that was really our first experience with seeing a blind individual uh, use the computer interface and, and use the technology of the time, which was JAWS and still is today, obviously. But, um, you know, that was, that was really just, you know, 
our first exposure to what that experience is like. And that's where the light bulb went off for us. It was like, hey, I know how, how could we maybe create a better sounding experience? And um, the the initial idea was the audio internet. And and uh, I actually, it's a funny story, Sean. Just the other day, I was I was digging through as, as we're, you know, moving offices. I was digging through. I found like the old original sign that was like audio internet uh, before <laughs> it was even audio I. So definitely get that. So, you know, you, you started there and then, you know, walk, walk, walk us through the journey. Hey, you started off with this idea of the audio, audio internet and quickly realized that, Hey, that might not be the, the best path to go down. Um, what was that pivoting point? What was that, you know, what was that feedback and where were you getting that feedback from, um, to, to really pivot to what audio is today, which is, you know, delivering digital accessibility experiences for hundreds of, you know, hundred thousand clients, uh, across the board. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the original premise premise for the company was probably the wrong idea, right? But it, it really sparked us on this path that, that you know, has, has been very um, fortunate for, for us and for the organization. And, and just in terms of, you know, wanting to create a better experience. And when it, originally, we, we uh, were very interested in making the audio quality improved, right? And then that, that slowly over like within a five year period started to morph into text to speech. And then it was like, okay, how could, how could we uh, do more with text to speech? How do we automate, use that automation layer to, to make this more practical? And, um, uh, so then we, you know, zeroed in on that and, and built some. And what, what years was this, Sean? Like, was this like 2005 to like 2008? You're like, Hey, we're going to try to create like a browser base you know, speech to text web. Uh, and like, that was those years of like, you know, listening and, and trying to figure out, Hey, like, how can I go to a website, click a button and have it read to me? Absolutely. Yeah. So originally it was that, that 2005 to 2010 time period where we were kind of looking at a, you know, creating a keyboard based user experience, um, allowed, allowing users to, to command the control of their, their web experience with keyboard and, and hear an audible audible feedback that would allow them to navigate. And there was a, you know, a navigation system centered around all that. And, it, you know, uh, it was ultimately a, just a, a series of years where we were learning, getting feedback, um, sharing ideas. In a lot of ways, uh, we were busy with our, our other ventures, right? And so it was yep. kind of always in the back burner. But one of the things that we did was as we would meet, you know, business professionals or or investors or, or, you know, smart technologists that had good ideas. We would share their, our ideas about audio I with them. And, and, and along the way we would, we kind of accumulated, you know, a good number of, of folks that, that when, when the time was right, we're going to be standing by and ready to support. And, and sure enough, uh, that, that came to fruition. Um, we really st- started focusing on audio I in earnest in, 2013 and at that time uh, my brother and I had kind of finished out some of our earlier ventures and uh, became really dedicated to focusing in solely on the idea of audio why and and taking it to the next level so and I, I heard in the beginning like when it was text to speech I think I you know and, and for our listeners I've been along the side with this journey with Sean since 2012 and I think like the first time that Nate ever pitched me he was like could you imagine coming to Snoop Dogg's website? It's Snoop Dogg's on the site and you click a button and it's like Snoop Dogg's voice. It's like, hey, welcome to my website. Obviously, cue Snoop Dogg's voice. I can't do it. And I'm not going to, not even going to try. But I, I thought that, you know, that was an interesting idea. But there was like, then we shifted, right? Like 2012 to like 2016. I think if we look at the history of audio, I like that's where it was like light bulbs were going off. And it was like, whoa, we are actually tackling this problem way wrong. Uh, we need to do it a separate way. So, you know, what what did that time frame from like 2012 to 2016, 2017? What did that look like um, from your eyes? I remember some very pivotal moments uh, with you know the NFB, the AFB, where we we you know took a ton of feedback and, and came back. But what, what you know, what in your eyes did did it from a product shift and just a perspective shift? What did we do? Yeah, so I mean, there was a really exciting time. A uh, lot of learning. Um, you know, we, we really had technologists that kind of get us where we wanted to go. We had, um, uh, we had capabilities of the browser technologies had caught up we have done away with macromedia. And so we could do a lot of, a lot more things that we couldn't do with HTML5 and, and whatnot. So we were kind of 
finally able to kind of create a very practical solution. Um, and in doing that, you know, showing it off to people and, and um, having, you know, a scalable model in place was, was um, something that we achieved early on. Um, but the feedback we got, of course, was just like, look, you know, I, we like what you're doing. It's, it's great. It creates a very specialized user experience for sure. But um, what about those users that come to the user experience that have their own assistive technology? And, and you know, how, how do we help improve that experience, right? Because um, no one wants to learn, you know, a bunch of new tools every time they go to a different website or, or whatnot. So, you know, of course, um, that was primary, primarily the feedback that, you know, we were interested in and, and wanting to learn more about what we could do with the technologies that we were creating. Uh, in short order, you know, we realized, look, uh, we're asking our clients to uh, implement our technology. What else can we do with it? And um, that's when we started looking at the way in which we can use JavaScript to manipulate the DOM and how we could um, re- ultimately test for issues of accessibility and remediate. And yep. um, to what extent could that be automated? To what extent could uh, there be you know, a manual component to that process? Everything from the testing to the fixing. Um, and that's when, you know, ultimately things got really exciting because now we're solving a real business need. Um, and, you know, coinciding with that, some of that timing was an uptick in, in litigation, right? Something that we always talked about, um, something that we had always, uh, you know, kind of, um, believed would happen, you know, started to happen with our phones ringing and, and businesses, um, really kind of just looking for help looking for for quick quick answers to tough problems that they didn't understand and um with our approach towards accessibility using the javascript to test and remediate was really unique in the marketplace at that time and um you know that's really where we started to get um our feet on the ground yeah i i remember those times sean i mean it was like it was like this strong pivot in like 2012 2013 and all of a sudden it was like, hey, we need to we need to like make these sites accessible to the WCAG success criteria. We started writing the rules engines to test against that. We started to try to figure out how we could get manual users. And I, I really think of like 2012 to 2016 as us figuring it out. And then as we look at where we are today and where AudioI is today, I mean, that was scale time, right? Like 2017 to like 2023 and, and beyond where we are is you know, scaling and how to get more manual users uh, in, into the platform. And what has that journey been like a little bit, right? It's it's from this crazy idea, Snoop Dogg's going to talk on your website, <laughs> to if we're actually going to try to make sites accessible to the WCAG success criteria by trying a, something no one else has really done before, by not just doing it at source, but using DOM manipulation, to a full set of service offerings from source code feedback to JavaScript, uh, to automated testing and scaling that to a hundred thousand clients today. Like what did that journey after 2016 look like? You know, it was a long one, but uh, you know, it, it was ultimately, um, it, it came down to, uh, listening to a lot of, a lot of feedback along the way. Right. Uh, we, we realized we needed to do more with our technology, have better ideas, um, in terms of solving actual issues for individuals with disabilities. And of course, businesses that are looking to do the right thing, but also, um, you know, addressing real problems in terms of litigation. You know, once we got through the years of hearing the no, you know, hearing the, those businesses that, that were saying, look, we love what you're doing, but I don't have funding or I don't have, uh, I don't have any way to, to, to really procure this tech type of technology because it was so new and different. Um, and we're also in the face of, you know, traditionalists of, of a very, um, long-standing process in terms of consultative approach to solving the issue. And so, you know, we were up against a lot of, um, a lot of obstacles, but, um, once we started, once we got through that and we, we proved ourselves with this business or that business, and, uh, it really did start to snowball and, but it wasn't fast enough, right? Because yeah. we had been at this for some time and, you know, we had investors that were looking to, to, um, you know, understand what their return was or understand, you know, what the, what the end game was. Um, and so, you know, we couldn't help but ask ourselves, how do we scale? How do we bring this to more 
more clients in a, in a, at a faster at a faster clip. How'd you do that? How do you? We went from I think like fifty clients, seventy five clients in like twenty sixteen to a hundred thousand clients in twenty twenty three, and we're growing by thousands of clients a month. Like, what strategy was implemented to to go do that? Not not just from the tech side, but like what what strategy was implemented to to go scale that across the board? Yeah, it came it came down to looking at um, the ways in which we could partner with our clients and finding niche providers that had their own customer base and presenting an opportunity for us to um, get our technology um, sold to, to that customer base, right? So solving the, the a business problem for that CMS provider uh, in terms of compliance and uh, making sure that the experience that they're providing their end clients is an accessible one um, while solving the needs of their individual clients at the same time with regard to, um, you know, compliance protection. I think I remember that, that meetings, like some of those meetings, I, I think we're sitting in the Tucson office, Sean, I think it was like 2017. And I was like, why don't we go to the people that are building these websites? Cause these bankers have no idea what the heck is on their website, but there's these companies that are building hundreds of websites, you know, for bankers and restaurants and so forth. And yep. the light bulb kind of went off. Right. And it was Absolutely. like, Hey, we, we can, we can hit both. We can manipulate the DOM. We can make the JavaScript remediations and we can take those source code feedbacks of what we're delivering and go work with the platform to go change out at the source code. That for me, I'm like, gosh, that was the light bulb. Right. Because yeah. we, there was, there was this hesitation of like, could we fix everything with just JavaScript, which like even today, Hey, we're the first to say you can't fix everything with JavaScript. There's still this manual component. And I think that manual, the, the identification of being able to understand that, hey, with all the data set that we get with the JavaScript, we can go work with the teams at the source code to make those remediations. That was that was the scaling opportunity for us. Absolutely. And, and it was able to scale, solve the problems um, and, and be able to, to, to deliver it across the board. Yeah. Yeah, it was that, you know, I remember those early partner conversations with regards to um, that baking provider in Texas, all yep. right, um, uh, where uh, they banks were getting hit pretty hard at the time, and we were we were getting little base hits in terms of getting clients onboarded quickly and efficiently, but nearly wasn't nearly fast enough. And then by partnering with that CMS provider, um, we were able to quickly get to onboard um, you know hundreds of clients at a time, right? And and then we it was natural that we would look at other industries. Um, Everything from uh, K twelve education to um, the dealer space, um, you know, just looking at restaurant uh, yep. restaurant CMS providers and and whatnot. Um, a good number of them where they're they're under a lot of duress with their customers calling and asking for support um, and needing a solution fast. And and we were really right place, right time with with the technology to to, to cater to that need. Absolutely. You know, you talk, you talk on these, Sean, and it's like, wow, like 20, 2012, and then there was four years, and then all of a sudden it started to, to, to figure out the idea, and then all of a sudden it scaled. But it's never easy uh, when starting a company, and, and there's a lot of things that you have to just kind of figure out, and you kind of have to have this like mantra that you use across the board. What was, what's maybe something for our listeners, like what's something that, that you used along this journey? I mean, 13 years now, we're talking since 2010, 13 years uh, of, of, of going at it with accessibility. Um, what are what are some of the mantras that you use during during those times that like, you know, hey, you, you thought you did it wrong or you thought that, you know, it might not be solvable uh, to keep yourself going and, and, and honestly to keep the to keep the passion of all the other in, you know employees at AudioI uh, pushing forward? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, took a great deal of work ethic, you know, the, the long long days where you know day after day you go out to the parking lot and you're the you know the you're the only car <laughs> that's the meaning <laughs> um and so you know that kind of just becoming a norm for a good number of years consecutively you know that was a lot yeah. but it, you know a lot at the end of the day it just came down to faith and like just understanding that you know your hard work's going to pay off and i think you know just doing the right thing by people along the way um you and I had the mantra of this, this believe mantra, you know, I think we would sign our emails yeah. and just like, no matter what, like, look, believe, you know, have faith. It's going to, it's going to come to fruition here. It's going to just keep, keep blocking and tackling and doing the things that we need to do. And, and sure enough, we were able to 
overcome a lot to, 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 to really start having success in the marketplace. Damn near got it tattooed on me. We were saying it so much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, that's, that's really what I, I think to, you know, to the point, and this is just so fun for me, Sean, to like sit here and talk to you because it's like reliving the last 10 years of our life of, of, of how we got here and, and you know, all, all the, all the tough times, but like you said, just belief and, and now just knowing that, Hey, we're delivering 2 billion remediations to the web for people with disabilities. And that number is growing, you know, by the thousands every single day of how many remediations and what is truly the impact that audio is having to the web for people with disabilities. And not only like one thing that was super cool for me is I, I got to see this LinkedIn video the other day. Uh, we have this new thing called the Alliance community. Sean, I, I know that you're aware of it. You know, it's, it's individuals with disabilities that test our websites. Um, and I think there was this moment the other day I was like on LinkedIn and I saw this new member of the Alliance community that has a disability that it's like their first job that they've had where they're able to contribute and able to, to utilize their assistive technology skills to drive revenue and drive income for their family. And I th- like, that was a moment for me. I just got chills. I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. Like, those those uh, those long nights uh, and and you know those those thousand times of saying believe like are coming to fruition on, on what we're doing, um, but there was like there was a few moments that were like whoa this this is actually going to work um, and I like for me looking back at it I think like the FCC working with Dusty Lawn uh, I think you know working working with some of the the partners and seeing the scale grow where all of a sudden it's like a hundred orders in in a week that we'd see come in with new websites. But what were what were you, some of your like moments where you know you saw that uh, the, hey this 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 is gonna work not only the company but the style right we we took a different approach to this we took a JavaScript approach while the entire market was in a consulting model that truly wasn't able to scale it um, but what were those moments that you saw that you were like wow we're we're on the right path uh, one story in particular that stands out is definitely you mentioned Dustin, Dustin Lown. Yeah. Um, Dusty was, uh, played a pivotal role in our success. He, you know, I was thinking about it more the other day and the way in which we were introduced to Dusty was really unique. And, and just for our users, Dusty was an individual that we got introduced to with the FCC. He was working a big project to get the, this project going, but yeah, Dusty was our, was our contact at, at the FCC. Yeah. He had a special role. Uh, yeah. It, a special role there at the FCC as a kind of an advisor, and he had a lot of, um, I guess, the uh, ability to, to to take action and yep. uh, pull the trigger on certain things, right? So um, I was thinking about uh, at the time we were at a we were I was at an investor meeting. I was like a, one of those late night ones where you're at a restaurant and you don't know if the 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 people at the table with you are just looking for a free meal or if they're actually interested in like you know, furthering the mission or like believing in the company and, and, you know, ultimately looking to maybe, um, make an investment. Uh, this one night was just a long one and definitely got the sense that, you know, probably, probably here for a free meal, but, uh, you know, at the, at the tail end of the meeting, I remember there's just one individual after having only spent like probably five minutes talking about the company and like, there was one individual that pulled, a, pulled me aside and said, Hey, look, meet me at this hotel at this, at this time in the morning. And, um, I asked someone you need to meet. And of course I was there the next morning, um, ready to go. And, uh, that's, that's how I met Dustin. Uh, really? Dustin, yeah. We sat down in the lobby. Uh, I had to kind of give my elevator pitch, um, told them about what we were doing. And then it was later on, it was, it wasn't too long after to where, um, he set up a meeting with the FCC. We, we were able to, to pitch to a group of individuals um, there, the Section 508 team and whatnot. And they, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a tough meeting just kind of selling our ideas and really talking to them about our different and you know, unique approach in the marketplace. Um, but fortunately, you know, having Dusty in that meeting and, and having his understanding of what we were doing, it wasn't long until a couple months later where the, sure enough, the FCC was kind of in a bind. They were looking to to get the consumer help portal launched um, that was really essential to allowing U.S. citizens to report issues to the FCC through their on, their website. And um, after a lot of great deal of work on their side to get that thing going, the Section 508 team um, had had issues with the level of accessibility. It was really, it was all forum based, and and the, the the screen reader users and testers were unable to 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 access and navigate that experience. And so 
asked uh, Dusty gave us a call and said, hey, I'm in a bind. We're, we got to go live here within the next couple of weeks. I think your technology is what is, is really built for this. Is that the case? And we're like, yeah. <laughs> you know, we spent the weekend doing what we do. And um, by Monday, um, we showed it off to the team, showed it off to um, their testers and got, you know, um, a resounding sign of confidence that they were ready to go. And um, that, that, that solution launched with audio wire in place. That was really when we caught our first break. It's interesting, like you say that, Sean, because like I kind of go back to the thought process of that time. I remember that deal like it was yesterday. I mean, I yeah. you know, love Dustin like brother. Um, and you know, I, I remember it was kind of like that that time because they were using Zendesk and like how could they fix Zendesk's source code within two weeks? And it was like all of a sudden that like kind of clicked the same time of the whole like, let's go attach ourselves to companies that don't have access to the source code nowadays we buy all these softwares all over the time like career learning you know career websites from you know these these applicant tracking systems or we buy these websites where they build everything on a template on something that we don't control source code i think it was like not only was that a pivotal moment to be able to say hey fcc is utilizing our technology but it was like this this shifting moment um, that, that we had, uh, where all of a sudden we're like, wow, there, this is a bigger use case than just the normal development team or product team that owns a, a website. This is even for the mid market businesses that are never going to be able to make their sites accessible because they don't control the code. And when you have seven different pieces of technology, that's way too much management to try to get it across the board. Now, hopefully in the future, all those other softwares are accessible by nature at the code. And, you know, we're, we're really focused on that. But that was kind of a pivotal moment as well. Um, one other thing, uh, just on like the kind of these these moments, I, I remember I was sitting in a meeting. I think it was you, me, and then David and Carr. And for those of you that know don't know, uh, David is our CEO, uh, and Carr Car Bettis is our executive uh, chairman. And we're sitting in a, in a meeting, and and I remember that David, you know, asked how many clients do we have. And I was excited. Like this was the time of AudioEye where we were getting like 25 orders a, a week from from you know partners. And I was like, we're on top of the world. It's really cool to have 25 clients when you only had two clients like three months earlier. Uh, so I was pumped up. Like you know, probably a little bit of ego, a little bit of, a little bit of swagger because I, I thought we were doing something. So we were so small, small in scale. And I think David was like, how many clients do you guys have? Like how many clients do we have? And like hey, we got we got. 400, 500 clients, whatever it was. And he goes, how many websites were built during the time we were in this meeting? And I was like, I don't know. So I looked it up. I'm like, probably 3000. He's like, okay, how the heck are we going to scale this? And I think that was kind of a, another moment for me that was like long-term focus, right? Like short-term focus was like, Hey, getting into these platforms, getting clients and going, but like long-term focus was like, wow, we're, we need to solve this for the web. Like we need to start really thinking about how we build this for five, 10 million websites for, you know, 50 million websites. Like we need to think bigger. We need to think scale uh, across the board. So I think, you know, that was another moment for me that kind of stopped us in our track of thinking that we climbed the mountain and then, and then finally looked up and we're like, oh, wow, we just left the parking lot. Um, yeah. and, and that, that was something great. And, you know, shout out to David and Carr for just believing yeah. in us. Right. I mean, that was a, a huge thing uh, that that just kind of helped our success was finding those investors and and, and those leaders that that really helped drive us uh, dur during that time. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we've been so fortunate to have Dave Marotti and and Dr. Carbetis uh, lead the charge, you know, with regard to the company and also just this whole idea around scalability. You yeah. know, it, it, there's we 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 just really weren't. Um, we had the solutions and the know-how to solve, you know, website at a time or whatnot, or, you know, to have incremental level of success in the industry, but, um, you know, really had a bigger vision just in terms of looking at the way in which we can leverage technology to solve this on a broader scale, which is huge. Absolutely. And when, when we talk about like solving this at scale on a, on like a, you know, broader, broader vision, I think it's like, brings me back to like the 2015 days, 2014 days of like, being a disruptive technology. And we've heard a lot in the last, you know, let's just say the last years with the year with like open AI and chat GPT being a disruptive technology and, you know, things like Uber being disruptive, but like truly audio, I was disruptive into the marketplace. Um, there was this traditional model of consulting is the only way to do this, but 
the web is still 97% inaccessible. Like there wasn't, this wasn't getting solved at the source code. And with all these new technologies, it was just breaking across the board. Uh, and then you had us come in with this, with this new idea and this new concept of saying, Hey, we will, we will manage accessibility for you. We will start to utilize manual testers to, to do this, but also not, you know, write remediations at the source code for you. What was so hard about being a disruptor? Like what, what made that so difficult? And even today it's, there's still diff- difficulties that we face, uh, in the market with this today, but what was in your view was so difficult, um, from that perspective? Yeah. I mean, lots of objection, right. Just, um, in terms of this idea that we should ask for our clients to implement a, a, a code onto their website, um, that has a lot of, um, capacity to, to make improvements, um, and to run tests and whatnot. But I mean, I think, uh, at the time when we first started doing this it was difficult enough to convince a website owner to include a, an accessibility statement just to, or just to invest in access it was it was hard enough to explain to someone that a person that's blind navigated the web like that was like no oh, yeah that was like foreign to a lot yeah. of a lot of or, or not only just individual the that that's blind like maybe even you know hey someone that has epilepsy could be affected by the way that you present your digital content even today we're we're doing education at that level right it's, yeah to educate our uh, prospective client to say, look, here, this is what this is about. Digital accessibility is a thing and here's why it's important. Um, and so, you know, doing that early on took a little bit more time, I think, just in terms of educating the marketplace um, with regard to the importance of the issue, um, you know, who it impacts and how it's how it's an important thing. Um, so once you get beyond that hurdle, then it was like, okay, that you know, if you talked about just even in, in, implementing an accessibility statement on a very basic level, that was like, oh gosh, you know, I, I already have enough things in my footer of my website. I don't need another one, right? But so it's like, not only did we want to do that, but oh, Mr. Customer, you should implement this this little icon on your website, and that should be displayed on every single page view. Yeah, uh, that's that was you know something that hadn't been done with regard to accessibility. It really put accessibility on the on the map in terms of demonstrating that uh, websites have a place for accessibility and are prioritizing the issue of digital inclusion in a new way yeah and so that that was that was pretty impactful for sure every time you have to say that you're going to try to do something that the industry really doesn't know about yet and then there's also you know this this pressure of legal pressure versus the right thing to do right yeah. and i think it's like the legal pressure started to rise and rise. And then people are like, oh, I need to do this because of legal pressure. And it's like, no, you need to do this thing because it's the right thing to do, right? Like right. people with disabilities ha- need access to web. And I think like no one drove that home more for me than like Tracy Jordan, right? Tracy Jordan was an early, um, you know, advocate that that we worked with. Uh, she's visually impaired. Um, and, you know, she would help us understand uh, how important it is for for you know individuals with disabilities to have access to digital content and really the independence that 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 drove. So I think it was like that first education level of like it's the right thing to do. Also, there's this legal pressure and finding the balance for companies. Um, and then on top of it, approaching this with JavaScript and approaching this by manipulating the DOM and approaching this different than an entire industry uh, has has definitely had its challenges. But you know, one thing, Sean, I'll give you credit for just everyone at audio. Why, um, you know, you know, from David to, to car and all, everyone that's still here today is, you know, we're, we're really pushing in one vision to make the web as accessible as possible, uh, for, for all users. And even when the, the, the hill is huge and we're trying to run, run up it, uh, you know, we're finding ways to, to do what's right for the users. Um, whether it's our Alliance community, making sure testing is getting done, making sure the JavaScript is getting the most up to date. Uh, testing suite. Really, it's all with that one vision and one goal uh, in place. So definitely a lot of hurdles and, and disrupting, uh, but you know, de- definitely a, a lot of um, a lot of things that we've been, been able to do to do it well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we, we really spawned an entire market with regard yep. to our, the approach, right? Um, by asking clients to add that, that little icon, that visible icon that's available to everybody onto the website, it really opened up accessibility in, in, in an entirely new way. And, yep. and for competitors or any, you know, anybody else, it was really an opportunity to say, oh, look, the, you know, this, this website has that thing on it. And yep. um, because I do it a different way, you know, that's a bad thing. And, and you, sh- you know, here's why. 
But at the, at the end of the day, if you look at our approach um, to solving the issue for our clients and for the, the, their constituents and the individuals that they, and their end users, right? Um, I, I think uh, it's really a, always been a holistic process that's been supported by our solution. And, and it really goes in the face of um, that traditional approach. But you know, we've been successful at kind of staying true to what is important with regard to digital inclusion and, and building our solution and services around that. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. And, you know, one of the big things I think we've just learned throughout the years and like we're just getting better and better at is you have to test with individuals with disabilities to understand the best use case, right? Yep. Accessible Accessibility isn't about making it sure it just meets the WCAG guidelines for those of our listeners. So WCAG guidelines are the web content accessibility guidelines. It's not just about those technical benefits. It's about building in users with disabilities to the testing process, making sure that they're getting validation that the site is usable. Uh, that's been a learning curve for me. Um, you know, I, I grew up in, in, in a world of like technology solves everything. You know, my iPhone here solves everything for me. Uh, but you know, truly testing and user testing uh, is something that we've done a really good job of listening and building it into the process, building it into our marketing over the years. Um, and we haven't always been perfect, right? Like yeah. Sean, I, I'll come out and yeah. say that. Like we haven't always been perfect, right? We were trying to solve this and, and do it in a scale away, but where we are today has been awesome. Yeah, difficult to message it all, right? Yeah. And trying to make it to where you got you grab people's attention and you convey, you know, the solution while um, not getting bogged down in the details. So that's always been a trick. But you know, I, you mentioned Tracy Jordan. Um, she was really uh, fundamental to our success early on, where she gave us a call one day. Yeah. Our phone rang, and uh, on you know we picked up the phone and we got an earful in terms of the different types of things that we weren't doing right or saying things that weren't really necessarily understood to the credit of our team. Um, you know, we threw, we, we flew her out, um, came to learn a lot about her. Uh, Dr. Jordan is, uh, someone who was bitten by a Brown recluse and, yep. um, lost her eyesight as a mother, uh, and, uh, a working mother at that and, you know, changed her life forever. Um, and she's used that to, to um, build an, an incredible career as an accessibility specialist in her field. Um, but her feedback uh, at that time was just something that we, we latched onto, we listened, uh, we made changes, we made sure that we didn't, um, I think from that day forward, you know, we tried to always make sure that if we were putting something out, you know, did it get tested for accessibility? Did, did you know, are we sticking to the, the types of uh, rules that we want our customers to abide by. Are we kind of adhering to those, that same set of rules? Absolutely. Um, those types of things were all critical and, um, came by way of feedback. Another one that, that, you know, we always think about is the input that we got from the AFB where, um, uh, you know, we, we were demonstrating our tools, and our capabilities. And one of the things that came up was just, you know, what about end users that need to report an issue or, you know, have need to get, um, some insight into uh, a particular problem that they're having. Um, and so that's where the help desk was born. And that's kind of been a central tool that's been included in our, in our tool set, um, for, for several years now, a solid decade plus where, um, end users can report issues. Those issues get fed into our specialists who can understand, um, the specific issue and, and get back to the end user in a timely manner and actually take effective control of, of um, making the necessary changes should they be required. Absolutely. I always thought it was interesting at AudioEye, like, you know, previously I was at an, you know, a B2C company, right? That was all just like driven off of the, the, the customer is the consumer. Uh, but when you work in digital accessibility, you know, you have, you have two different uh, groups that you're, that you're really trying to present to. One is the client that's buying the software or buying the technology and services that you're providing. The second is the user, right? Which the user is that the actual individual with a disability that is trying to utilize that consumer's uh, website or, or whatever is being published to them. I always thought that that was like this interesting thing that took us some years to figure out as well as like, you know, what are the two that we're trying to feed? And I think it, it took me a long time to understand that it's all just one goal, right? The, the customer has to have the goal of making a site accessible for people with disabilities. And the, the, the individual with a disability has to have the one goal of being able to utilize 
uh, that website. So really just creating one unified goal of, hey, the web needs to be accessible for people with disabilities. Um, you know, and, and that, that's pretty much it. So, you know, with that, I mean, audio wide today, right. We said, you know, above $30 million in reoccurring revenue We're you know, in offices in New York and in, in, in Lehigh, Utah and Portland, Tucson, I think, I think it's just you and I and, and Damien left in, in Tucson, though, Sean, maybe a few other folks, uh, Kaylee and, and Matt, but really what's really the future? Like, what do you see and what is, what is the future of audio and, and, what got us here? Like if you, if I said, Hey, give me two things that got us here. Uh, what is that? And where do you see the future? And what, what makes you so excited about, about where we're going? Yeah, I think what got us here and what's going to take us into the future is definitely our people, right? I think, um, we've always just been backed by uh, incredible technologists and, and also, um, you know, with the build out of our Alliance community, um, getting the level of feedback that we've like, we've never had before is just incredible. Um, you know, early on, I think you and I remember working with Pete here in the Tucson office and, and he was uh, an individual who was, um, became blind as a, as a product of a work, uh, accident. Right. Um, and, uh, kind of reinventing his whole life around that as being a father of a few children and, um, you know, he became a, an accessibility tester for us. Um, provided invaluable feedback in terms of making our products uh, better and, you know, testing our client websites and everything else, right? And building a technology, building a testing team around that um, was was critical. I think today we've kind of uh, have an incredible amount of resources that um, are really focused on that single goal of eradicating digital barriers. And, um, I think that's really what's going to be the difference as we look to, to the future. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more, Sean. I mean, it's, it's been fun. Like all these stories, right? I feel like you and I could go on forever and ever. I mean, it's been, uh, it's been a lot of years of just great stories, but just, you know, hard times and, and overcoming them. And then just as we look into the future, like some of the things I'm just excited for is, you know, we're taking a different approach even than we were three years ago. Like we're coming out with this new software development lifecycle tool. We're coming out with different ways that the Alliance community can test faster for set sites and that we can get feedback faster. So I'm like, I'm super excited to, to, to get us into that next phase of not only remediating sites through JavaScript and, and manual testing, but like this whole software development, can we shift it a little bit left um, and also be able to meet the client where they are. Um, but it all comes down to the people. Uh, and, and, and what we and what we've believed in uh, from the beginning. So yeah, and they're the they're the ones that are going to advance our technology, right? I think um, we've got uh, we've made inc incredible strides just in regards to the capabilities and reaches of automation, and we're going to continue to push the envelope there. Um, but also looking at you know different use cases, right? Um, the we've got the do it for you solution kind of fully baked and understood, and then as we look at the it, you know, do it for yourself crowd, um, and providing tools that empower them, um, uh, that leverage the same test suite. And it's kind of all baked into the same, um, solution set, I think is going to be a very powerful, uh, a powerful thing in the marketplace. I think, um, we're going to continue to see more sophisticated, uh, businesses out there that are looking to do the right thing and take steps. And they're going to have different approaches and different needs. And uh, we're really building our our our, our technology stack to uh, to address those different needs in different ways. Absolutely, and and we've met so many awesome people along the way, Sean. I think you know we we have people that we met along the way that you know have, have gave us guidance. We have some new folks that are joining us that are that have been influential, that have been like you know mentors to us, that are, are joining us along in this journey that we're excited to to share here in the future. Uh, but Sean, I just, I just want to say, man, it's been awesome chatting today. It's been awesome working aside to you, uh, the, the last 10 years where it's you and I just walking out to the car and being like, well, it's another night and it's still dark out while we're leaving. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, it's been so fun, uh, and, and just learning, uh, you know, a, as much as we can. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for, for everyone listening. Um, and let's, uh, let's make sure we make the web a more inclusive, uh, inclusive place for all. So thank, thanks everyone. Thank you, Ty. Thank you. Hearsay is produced by Soja Rank, Mike Barton, and Sean Bradley, and edited by Grant Lemons. And if you enjoyed this podcast and don't want to miss future episodes, please subscribe to our YouTube channel.
Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time when Don Torres, partner manager at Civic Plus, talks about the seismic shift for accessibility coming to the government in 2024.